Good evening and uh, a warm welcome to our next webinar here at uh, JFT Brokers and a warm welcome in the name of JFT Brokers as well. My name Stefan, Stefan Friedrichowski, as maybe already typically for those kind of webinars with those strange titles. And since it's the first webinar uh, 2019, I think it's uh, still a good time to wish you all the best. Uh, I hope you have had a good start into 2019 and that this year will be a wonderful year for you. Um, yeah, so that brings me already to the date. We have today the um, 17th of January, January uh, 7 p.m. So everything as usual, even in the new year. The title of today might be a little bit strange. A mathematician is looking at the markets. Okay, I think I have to correct myself twice, even already with the title. Uh, most of uh, you will know that uh, I'm indeed not a mathematician, I'm a physician. But anyhow, I thought the title uh, is this way a little bit better than um, to use physics here in that title. No, so, okay, that's the first correction. The other one, of course, um, the mathematician is not really looking at the markets <clears throat> in terms like uh, going to Frankfurt and uh, see what's going on there uh, directly at the stock uh, uh, market. No, of course not. So we will have a look to the prices and that will be the main look and um, everything around that. So otherwise, I just could stream <clears throat> um, the view uh, to Frankfurt up, and anyhow, that would be not a good idea. Um, so we change perspective. That is what we, we what I really meant with that kind of title. So today we do not really talk about new trading strategies, um, and even. Um, there might be one a little bit um, talking about EMAs and uh, that for a lot of people is already a trading strategy and uh, I will try to show or convince you that it's maybe not the best idea. Um, but so it's not about trading strategies as um, for lots of other webinars. It's more the way of thinking. It's uh, a few practical uh, examples of what changes if you look from a different perspective? And it's, it's more an invitation to, to share that, uh, that view. And maybe it will uh, open a few new relevant things for you as well. At least that's what I have um, in mind doing exactly that kind of webinar. As always, you can, oh, no. You can't. Uh, I will do it as we speak uh, because, of course, you should already be able to download the slides of uh, today's uh, webinar. So you have um, then already the slides. Um, later, I will have a couple of Excel sheets as well. Um, so if you have interest in those, no problem. Just send me an email. I unfortunately cannot upload those Excel sheets here into that uh, go to webinar control panel uh, because uh, that's restricted to PDFs only. Uh, yeah, and a PDF of an Excel sheet is, I think, a little bit boring. Just send me an email here exactly to that email address s. Friedrichowski. I know complicated last name, so just call me Stefan at jfdbrokers.com. Come. Okay, um, before we really start, you know the procedure, it's um, as every year, um, I have to show around that uh, this risk disclaimer. So we talk about trading, you talk about trading ideas or uh, some methodologies, what you do finally with your own trading activities, of course you do it on your own and um, yeah, you are responsible for any trade executed. Of course, I think is it self-explaining. I'm always smiling when I do uh, that kind of part during the webinar. But uh, it's a legal um, obligation to do exactly that. So a little bit more in detail of how we touch the topic today. So first of all, I want to talk about some fundamental differences if, if we change exactly that kind of perspective uh, between maybe let's call him a standard, normal, regular trader uh, and uh, that uh, mathematician. 
that's only a few aspects, but uh, it's worth to, to, to share that with you as well. Then we go a little bit more because we talk about prices. Then we have to think about what's really behind the chart. Hey, we all love our charts, and in most cases, uh, cases it will be the candlestick chart or something similar to that bar chart, or uh, yeah, you name it. Um, but what's really behind? And is it really worth to spend so much time to investigate the chart itself, the formations of candles and everything around? Let's think about that. You may um, already expect my answer on that, but uh, let's see what, what uh, I can present there. Then we, if you are already in charts, um, then the typical procedure is to to have EMAs in the chart. And even if you look to my charts, I have always an EMA in my chart. Um, I have, I think, more or less no chart without an EMA within that chart. But still, you see here, I write down sense and nonsense of EMAs. So, of course, there will be some sense, um, but there's a lot of nonsense about and around EMAs as well. Let's talk about that, and we will really investigate that um, a little bit more in depth because uh, that can be done just by some Excel sheets. So uh, it's a pretty easy task. And then let's really look what's the meaning of an EMA. Next topic will be around uh, the statement, trading is asymmetric. That's a strange title, isn't it? Uh, it's always funny if I name that. But indeed, trading is it is asymmetric. So, what I do mean, what I really mean with that statement, and what are the consequences of that, is quite interesting. Uh, let's see. Um, and it really sounds like a mathematician or a physician uh, that kind of statement. And finally, let's really talk about trading, and maybe astonishingly, it will be. Trading is a business of small numbers. And you see I use here already capital now, uh, capital letters um, to emphasize small. Most of the people think about trading as uh, yeah, big trades. Hey, next winner trade will change my account totally to the positive side. And no, that's not trading. Let's look to the small numbers and how those small numbers can finally uh, give a good equity in your trading account. So let's start with a change of perspective. Honestly, I think most of all traders, maybe you as well, I'm not sure, I have no idea. Indeed, you have those mathematical glasses. I'm not sure whether that's a re really good English uh, phrase as well. At least in, in German, we use that uh, kind of, of a phrase, mathematical glasses, mathematical understanding or behavior or view or you name it. But in most cases, I think uh, for all of you and even maybe myself as well, it's less pronounced. If we really change to a pure mathematical perspective, then it's a little bit different. Let's start. For a mathematician, the markets, the markets are just and only generating a time series of prices. Hmm. Strange statement as well. What do I mean? All we see and all we can get out of the market or in terms of what kind of information. Okay, we can have a lot of information, uh, reading news uh, about uh, what's going on, um, some econo economic statements for specific regions and something like that. But finally, all what counts and what really matters are the prices. And those prices created that kind of time series and nothing else. The next price, the next price, and the next price. And all kind of informations are influenced, or those, all other informations influence exactly that kind of price. So finally, it's a good thing to look exactly to those prices only, and maybe some additional informations like uh, trading volume, or even um, if you have the possibility to look into order books, even those kind of um, sources for information you, you might use. 
And finally, we talk about time series and nothing else. So uh, that's trading, looking to those prices. The mathematician is using statistics extensively. It means all we want to, to prove or, uh, is that we find some specific edges. And definitely for a mathematician, the statement will be true, no trade without a proven edge. And really think about that statement. Think about maybe your own trading. Think about next day, yesterday. How often you might enter trades without a proven knowledge that you have really an edge, a probability advantage for exactly that trade you are doing. Yesterday, the German webinar, it was just only uh, one day ago. Now we have two days ago, uh, we have had the Brexit um, decision in the British Parliament, um, at least the vote uh, around that. How can we use it? Honestly, you might have an opinion of what will happen. And in that case, it was more or less known um, that will be no majority for uh, May's plan. But what can we do out of that information? Do we have any proven edge for the trade we might create out of that? Honestly, I thought with that decision um, instantly, uh, the, the, the British pound would get weak. The opposite was right. Afterwards, we know we are always uh, we know always better than before, and we find the, the uh, good argumentation for exactly that kind of behavior. So, without a proven edge, no trade. And please think about that statement as well. So that means finally, a mathematician spends most of the time exactly with the search development and proof of those edges. Um, and not really with trading itself, because after we exactly find those kind of edges, the trading itself is just a follow-up. It's just the execution of what we have learned before uh, during our development phase, and then we just execute those trades according to our uh, trading rules. So the trading itself is really boring. I know that when we look about uh, our trading, when we look to our trading account, <clears throat> from time to time, hey, we, we spent time looking to uh, nice chart movements. And honestly, I do that as well. Um, the two days ago, uh, I was watching in television a um, handball uh, game. And then I saw, oh, um, parliament decision is done. I uh, stepped out to my computer and uh, looking what is going on in the markets. Is there anything around or... Do I have something out of that financially? Answer, of course, no. I have not changed any trade position, nothing. Um, but I was simply curious of what's going around. So, uh, of course, I will do, I do that as well. Um, finally, for a mathematician, of course, gut feeling or any beliefs or, um, do not play any role for anything. I have to make the statement, there might be people who really, who are really good in exactly that, that they, they have a feeling of, yeah, tomorrow ducks may turn to the north. And they might be right. It was exactly that kind, let's call it analysis or whatever uh, um, will drive exactly that kind of conclusion. Honestly, I do not know somebody else like that. But still, I believe there are people around which really have a good feeling for the markets and uh, that they can uh, even mm, turn those feelings, that, that kind of gut feeling, into really positive traits. Back to what is the origin of what do we handle as a mathematician if we look for trading? Of course, first thing is we have to look to the basics and the basic is the price. So that means we have normally, or uh, what we normally do is we look to the uh, to the left picture here, to that kind of chart. Uh, in this case, it's um, an M15 chart of uh, Euro, New Zealand dollar, um, I think two days ago. Um, 
yeah, and that's of course, as you see already an EMA in my chart because that was a screenshot of uh, uh, exactly my chart. Yeah, that, that's how we look to the markets. In this case, an M15 um, candlestick chart. You may play around, uh, use different time periods for, for your uh, chart, uh, M5, M1, H1, H4, D1, whatever. But that's not the reality. The reality, the reality is something different. That's on the right hand side. The reality is just that time and sales list of prices. In this case, it's a screenshot of uh, 14th of January, and that is, I think, Euro US dollar. Um, and you see the date, you see the time, and even now we need uh, um, subs uh, from from seconds. So uh, here, 0.15 second, 0.25 second, and then we get price just on the ask and on the bid size, and that sequence is the real stuff. That's what normally is called just tick data, or let's call it time and sales list as well. There are some other differences, but I think that uh, is not that important right now. So those tick data are the real source we should deal with. But unfortunately, it's quite boring to, to look at those numbers. And now we can go back to what is done with our candlesticks. The, the candlesticks have only one purpose, and that is visualization. And honestly, nothing else. What candles are doing is that they condense, let's call it that way, they condense the time and sales list or the tick data uh, to a given period. And they can just create four numbers, open, high, low, and close. So the open is the first tick within that period. The close is the last tick within that period. And then within um, that period, we look for the high and the low. So we condense 15 minutes of tick data for M15 to four numbers. That's what candles are and nothing else. From a more um, mathematical perspective, it's a compression of data. Uh, and unfortunately, of course, uh, we lose some information. So it's a lossy, uh, a lossy uh, compression of data, like JPEG pictures or something like that. But candles are finally nothing more. And even if we, if we look to some, some specific candlestick formations, like, uh, for example, dojis, um, unfortunately, within my chart, there's no really good example. Uh, a little bit here behind my, uh, uh, next to my cursor, I think it's, it's quite small, but I think you know what a doji is. So more or less a doji is nothing else uh, than a candle um, with an open and a close at more or less same level. And uh, in between, we have uh, somewhere a high and somewhere a low. And we call that a real nice doji if that is a little bit more symmetric. But let's go back. What does it mean? It only means that the open and the close of that candle are at the same level. And yeah, of course, we have a high and a low, which is... Um, more or less symmetric about uh, around that. That doesn't mean anything. It only means that within those 15 minutes, close and high have been on the same level, and in between, we have had a high and a low. Uh, I repeat myself, you see, um, there is no other information. You cannot call that candle something like a candle of uncertainty. We, we just would go for another time frame, M20 or M48 or H1 or whatever. And that might change the picture totally. Um, and we don't have a doji anymore. And therefore, it's. I think we spend too much time in putting too much meaning exactly into those kind of uh, candles. And if you go back, what is really behind, then it's only that time series. And 
nothing else. So we we can only get some information. Um, of course, we can look exactly to the um, to the uh, tick data, and I will do it uh, here right in a minute. Uh, there's some additional information we can get out of that, but not that much. Still, we need to look to the complete time series, and of course, still we can use compressed data or condensed data uh, in, in terms of candles. But we have to keep in mind that what really counts are the tick data behind and uh, not mm, the looking of any candle. So here we have those tick data. I have downloaded uh, the one day here um, at uh, Dukas Copy. You can do it for free. And um, uh, that download is already close to eight megabyte uh, file size. Uh, in total, it's uh, 138,000 um, uh, ticks. So um, since the day has about uh, eight, uh, 86,400 seconds, so let's round it, it's about two ticks per second, at least what we see at that kind of broker. Uh, there's some additional information in those tick data as well, uh, at least at Dukas copy, but I don't think that there's a good meaning behind. It's called ask volume. And it's, it, uh, it is called bit volume, but uh, definitely I'm sure that it's not really what's behind because if I look to the numbers, as I start with 0.1 um, and then still they are double digit so i'm i'm not sure what's really uh, the meaning of, of those data so i will not uh, uh, go into those uh, anymore what we can take out of the data here of course we can calculate the spread and i've done this and uh, in the lower end chart uh, i plotted the spread and of course we can see um, that is um, gmt time here so um, 10 p.m. Uh, would mean uh, German time 11, um, 11 p.m. What we see here between uh, a little bit more than one hour, it's one and a half hour, we see that a spread widening, which is uh, typically for all uh, the markets here, spread goes up to uh, three bips uh, here. And um, yeah, otherwise, there might have been some news around 12 and 16. Therefore, we have some, we have some spikes here. But that's what we can see out of those data. The other good thing is we can see I have plotted just the, um, the time itself here. And uh, then we can take some information out of the slope of that graph uh, in the upper end um, until 7, uh, 7 o'clock uh, GMT. Um, the slope is uh, steeper than uh, later, which means not that many ticks uh, per second or per, uh, per time. And then much more ticks and uh, starting at uh, four or five o'clock in the uh, in the afternoon um, yeah so market slows down once again so less ticks less volume um, less prices nevertheless let's keep in mind those tick data are the origin and are standing behind the chart if you really look if you want really to be in all the data we have, we would have to use those. Still, we can use our candlestick uh, numbers, of course, um, because we can use that condensed data for any analysis as well. But we have to 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 be sure what we are doing. We have to keep in mind uh, that the real meaning of any candle. I would give it not that much information. I know. There are a lot of people telling you exactly the uh, the opposite, um, but that's at least uh, my understanding from that more mathematical point of view. Okay, but let's go on with that. Um, and let's see what we can take out of, um, of those kind of charts um, as well. Because uh, let's let's go start with the chart, really, what... what uh, uh, what I'm normally doing as well here. So here's even my computer screen, and you see all my my charts have um, have an EMA within the chart, and 
there might be the question, why I use an EMA or why other people are using EMAs in, in nearly every chart. Uh, of course, sometimes it really looks brilliant. Look, look around here to that chart. Um, in this case here, price is above EMA. That would be a good long opportunity. Um, and uh, later we would have another long opportunity right well here. Uh, price is really far above uh, EMA. So it looks a little bit like above EMA going long below let's go to the uh, left hand side here below EMA let's go short um, and okay it's from time to time it doesn't work uh, as we see here um, yeah that's now here statistically uh, maybe an example of one two three four five uh, something like that so that's not a real statistical analysis we have to go into that much more in depth in order to draw any conclusions. If you look to the chart, and let, uh, let me change uh, um, here the, the, the timing, I now go for D1. Oh, once again, it looks brilliant. Here, above EMA, we should go for long trades, short trades, and uh, later short trades. And once again, as you see, we, we, it seems that we immediately find the proof within the chart that that idea to, to use an EMA for trading um, sounds or looks like a brilliant idea, um, as you can see within the chart. The downside is that we look for exactly that, what we want to see. That means we look exactly to those periods of time where our hypothesis is exactly right. And we ignore all the other cases um, which we don't like and we don't want to see. So there's only way out, one way out, and that is let's do it uh, mathematically. But before I do, just uh, a starting about that. EMAs and SMAs, uh, which uh, is from at least for me more or less the same. I know, of course, the, the right calculation between uh, EMA and SMA. So SMA is um, yeah, it's just the average of, uh, let's say, for an EMA, uh, SMA 200. It's the average of the last 200 close prices of whatever candle period we have chosen. Um, so that's uh, quite easy to understand. EMA is calculated a little bit different uh, in a way that uh, the near history is more pronounced, more weighted uh, than the uh, prices which are uh, more far in the past. Um, but anyhow, it, it doesn't really change the overall picture. Um, it's uh, yeah, a little bit, uh, yeah, it's only cosmetic, at least for my end. Those indicators are really the most popular uh, tools within any chart. But I think that the meaningfulness of those indicators are commonly really overestimated. As we have seen in my chart, it looks quite well, but let's do the clear analysis. And um, But before doing that, let's change the perspective once again, because then we will find out already what's an EMA really. EMA or SMAs are really solely a methodology for price smoothing and nothing else. An electrical engineer would just say it's a low pass filter. So it's noise reduction. That's all. Um, all the, that wiggling around, um, yeah, that is canceled. That is smoothed out uh, with an EMA or an SMA. So from, from, from uh, an audio perspective, it's something like uh, noise reduction. Still, it's something good to have it in the chart because we see around that noise. If you just look to the EMA, unfortunately, the, the EMA itself, we cannot trade. But remember, we have had already strategies um, like mean reversion strategies where we use the EMA as something as a fair value. And if we have... Um, huge distances between the current price and that EMA, we use those exactly for entries for trades. So yes, we can use EMAs, but not maybe just um, in the way I used it um, when I talk about my chart. And I will 
say, I will do an analysis and I will not really prove that there is no more meaning within that EMA, but at least it's an analysis and I, will, I would like to share that with you as well. So what I have done, I simply took uh, D1 data here and I use the same and you can have the Excel sheet with the H1 data as well, but uh, even the D1 uh, Excel sheet is already quite slow uh, doing the calculations and uh, those graphs here. Um, Therefore, I do everything here with D1 data, but I used other time frames as well. So what I have done here, um, of course, uh, the price, uh, date, uh, um, open, high, low, close, as always. Then I calculated the, e the real EMA, not the SMA, uh, with the standard formula. Um, and uh, with some period, we can change that. And then I, what I calculated as well is just the difference between the current close and the close of the day before or the candle before and that in absolute numbers and in percentage values um, then i looked i have a look whether the day before was that day that close was that above or below the ema and thinking about what we have done in the chart was okay if we are above the ema um, that we should go for a long trade. That was the basic idea. And um, therefore, I would then, based on that close price, I would start, let's call it a trade, and would close that trade at the close of the next day. So therefore, I have to look for the previous day in order to do the calculation and to do that decision. And what I have done here, I then calculated exactly that trade as being a trade with 0.01 lots. And up to now, we will change that in uh, about five minutes uh, without any spread and commission. Okay, you might say that's not trading, you're right. Uh, but for first calculation, let's do it without any costs. So no spread, no commission. And therefore, we can even theoretically close every day every candle that trade and we open the next trade uh, once again um, it doesn't matter in this case because we don't have any costs if we would look from a more trading perspective of, co of course we would not close the trade if we would reopen in the same direction um, and therefore, I prepared that Excel sheet here already for those switches. Switch would mean, hey, direction changes, and later we will incorporate the costs here once uh, within those um, trades as well. Let's start with um, the upper picture. That is just the price, Euro, US dollar over the last uh, 16 years or 15 years, uh, and you will see the EMA as well. You see strong long movements here, uh, really quite well. Then a period with some changes here, a period with very good short opportunity. Let's call it that way. But now let's look what is the equity curve without any spread and commission. I have to emphasize that. And you see the result is um, quite disappointing so with my 0.01 lot trades we would have earned uh, over the last uh, 16 years in total 300 dollar well um, let's change EMA, ema period to some other values uh, let's go uh, down the road so i started with um, 200 56 and now i go down here to 128 you see this is my standard procedure that i do it uh, just by a factor of two okay the picture doesn't really change that much um, let's go further down hopefully it will uh, get better um, but i can tell you already it will not get uh, better so we can choose whatever ema period we want uh, we will not be convinced of any EMA period, which really helps us here uh, to get good results. There are times where it really works, um, but there are also always times those, those sideward 
markets uh, where we lose money with that kind of strategy. And that, I repeat myself, even without costs, so without spread and commission. Is that a proof that there is no intrinsic meaning of um, any uh, EMA? Of course not. Uh, it's not a proof, but it's a good hint that we should not base our trades just on uh, how close prices are um, related to any EMA. So, uh, you see, uh, finally, I have an equity curve which goes to the minus uh, within, within that kind of situation. Um, but also the, the positive ones uh, have not been really uh, good examples for a new trading strategy. But we see we have now a negative value. Okay. Um, that brings me to the next topic. Since my last equity with a small EMA was um, going was going south, so I would have lost lots of money. And then we might have the idea, hey, brilliant, let's change the trades, go from what is originally meant to be a long trade, then we should change it to a short trade and vice versa. But unfortunately, trading is asymmetric and that now you see exactly what I mean. And that's because, so the real reason behind the asymmetry is spreads and commission. They cause the asymmetry in all those trades, which means that finally a loss of a long trade is not automatically the profit of the same short trade. You see what I mean? We sometimes think about in those kind of dimensions that we can do it, but because of spreads and commission, it's not symmetric. So the profit as uh, a loss of a long trade is not the profit of a short trade. Let's call it the same short trade. That's um, uh, uh, or um, let me start my sentence again. Um, there are a lot of trading, um, social trading platforms where you even have something which is called reverse mirror trading, which means, hey, you might find a trading strategy within those hundreds you can see there, uh, which is going south, 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 south. So a real loser strategy. And then you might have the idea, hey, let's turn that into a profitable one just by switching all the trades, by mirror the, all the trades from long to short and short to long. But um, that's not a good idea, at least not in general. Uh, mathematically, you can do it, but only if there's one condition fulfilled. And that is what I call there are what I call here now the gross loss of those trades, gross in the sense of without spread and commission. If that gross loss of those trades is bigger, ex is exceeding all the costs for spreads and commission, and um, in this case I do a mathematical mistake because uh, I compare a minus number with a, so it's not really bigger, it's a, Mathematically, it would be a smaller, but you know exactly what I mean. So only if that gross loss are bigger than all the sum of spreads and commission, then it's a good idea to use mirror trading, but only under that uh, condition. It, in order to show you that a little bit, I go back to the same Excel sheet I have um, um, shown you as, uh, already. Uh, and because I can just enable anything here. So let's use, uh, for example, a spread and commission um, of um, 20 cents here for my 0.01 trade. Uh, so that would, should accumulate um, for, for spreads and commission. It's maybe a little bit too high, but anyhow, uh, just for illustration, it uh, exactly works. So now you see we have an equity, um, yeah, going south. <clears throat> Brilliant. That's the idea now for for going for mirror trading. And 
just within the Excel sheets, it's quite easy to do because I have uh, prepared here already a reverse flag. And unfortunately, oh, you don't see it. Um, I have now a set clock here. Uh, the computer is doing um, this, uh, a safe procedure here for that Excel sheet. So it will take um, hopefully not too much time. So now I can change here my reverse to minus. What practically means, I change all the directions of the trades. So what has been a long trade is now a short trade and vice versa. And you see, yeah, my equity is better than the previous one, but still not good enough. So I could not change my negative equity by doing exactly the reverse trades and enter finally in positive uh, in a positive equity. Of course, it's not right. And the reason behind is simply spread and commission. Um, it's that easy. So trading is asymmetric, and we have to keep that in mind always. Uh, if you think about trading strategies, developing trading strategies, uh, that we cannot just use reverse trading if we find something which goes south. Let's be a little bit more practical, because I mentioned trading is a business of small numbers. Hmm. I think a lot of people, and I don't do not think that uh, you belong to that kind of group because otherwise you would not listen to to webinars like this one here. Uh, that really trading is something around big profits, big profits in the sense. Okay, I have a one thousand euro account, and next trade with my plus five hundred uh, euro, uh, that trade will yeah will bring me back on track. Uh, that I'm really. Uh, earning money with my trading strategy, with my account. No, if you would have something like that on this 1,000 euro account and the next, hopefully, 300 winner trade will do the job, then this is not trading, that is gambling. That is nothing else than gambling. Real trading is just the sum of all small trades, small winner, small winners and small losers. It's not to sum up some good big trades and in between have some losers. No, um, that would be gambling. Let's be a little bit more practically here. Let's let's do a, a short and quick statistics and later we will do it in an Excel sheet. Um, but, but let's start with, with numbers as you might know, may know. Uh, maybe you have to, to multiply everything by a factor of 10. I don't know. Let's start with an account of 1,000 euro. And let's think about we have target uh, on a year base of 20%. So finally, after one year of trading, there should be not any more 1,000 euros. There should be 1,200. Mm. You may think, oh, that's not a good target. That's a small, once again, a small number. Uh, but honestly, if you even would go for that number and you can proof that you can do that kind of job uh, 10 years in a row, then you're really a perfect trader, I can um, say, yeah. But let's, for a moment, let's keep it as 20%. Let's think about we are doing 250 trades per year, which should reflect exactly one trade per day, um, excluding Sundays. So therefore, the numbers uh, are fitting quite well. And let's think that we trade with 0.02 lot. That might be a good standard situation for, for a lot of traders. So of course we have to incorporate costs per trades and uh, here even for that 0.02 lot trade now I, I um, assume uh, 20 cent um, which is not uh, possible at uh, Every broker, there are a lot of brokers which are more expensive for that, but let's keep it uh, at 20 cents. That means that our 250 trades, which costs per trade 20 cents, that multiplies or sums up already to 50 euros. So we need extra 50 euros just because of uh, the cost of trades. So finally, we, we need, in order to, to hit our 20% target, 
after costs, uh, we need to earn 250 euros. And since we are doing 250 trades, that would mean we need one euro per day as a final result for every day. Hmm. Now you see we are back to my small numbers. So we need an expectation value of exactly one euro. Then we would hit our final target of 20%. Practically, it would look more like this kind of sequence. Um, like, okay, the one day we have plus 30, then maybe three times in a row minus 10, one, 25, and uh, two times, as you see what I did, have done here. So finally, those seven trades would sum up to five euros, uh, which would be uh, 71 cents per day. So we are already close to our target of uh, one euro per day. But now comes the critical question. How can we realize that we are on track? And I, mm, let's say that way, I disappoint you already uh, at the very beginning. That, to answer that question seriously is extremely difficult. We need not only 200 trades, no, we would need far more than a couple of thousand trades in order to, uh, to, to answer the question whether we are on track, yes or no. Because even if we would lose money after 250 trades, finally, it might, maybe we, we have not earned 200, we lost uh, 100 euro, we might be still on track. That's maybe astonishing, but that's statistics. Let's look to that because we can simulate that quite easy. And um, let's go here. So what I have done here, um, so we, I simulate a trading account. That's what I'm doing here. And to simulate the trading account, I use random numbers and I have a certain hit rate, oh, sorry, that's still in German, so Schwelle means uh, threshold. So finally, that is the hit rate. In my case here for that, uh, uh, let's call it a trading strategy, which I want to simulate here. I have a hit rate of 55% and my average um, gain is plus one, my average loss is minus one, my risk per trade should be 10 euros. Um, so that would mean finally either I uh, earn 10 euros or I lose 10 euros. But in both cases, I have to pay commission and spread, uh, which I said is 20 cents for exactly that trade. And then I calculate that kind of trading sequence. So that would reflect my trading results after each day. And sometimes I lose, sometimes I win. And uh, I'm already uh, at a hit rate of 55% because otherwise, including uh, spreads and commission, I would not even earn any money. Um, so my expect expectation value is finally 80 cent, which multiplies exactly to my 200 euros after 250 trades. So good. And you see here a trading, um, the equity on the right hand, uh, but not only for one year, no, <laughs> that's already for in total 40 years. So after 10,000 trades, and that equity looks brilliant. I mean, pff, uh, I think every, everybody for, of us uh, would have or would like to have that equity within our own trading account. And still, oh, okay, okay, there are drawdowns. Mm, quite well, I, I can live with that. But let's go a little bit more in detail because 250 trades, so exactly one year, is only an extremely short period within that chart. Um, and from here to here, for example, there are 500 trades and we would, have, we would not have earned any money. And you find similar situations within the chart. In order to, to pronounce that kind of situation even more, I have done another calculation here within the chart on the left-hand side. And what we have here is the average profits after 3,000 trades, calculated after 3,000 trades, after 5,000 trades, and so on. We know from that kind of strategy, because in this case it's mathematically done, we know 
the hit weight. We know the expectation value. We know exactly the uh, those numbers which describe that kind of strategy. So we know that finally we will be on 80 cent per trade. But you see how long it takes to come to that value? So we need thousands of trades in order to, to really show up that average expectation value. So that means even if we have such a trading strategy in our real trading account and we are just looking after one year, we might not know whether we are really on track. In order to illustrate that a little bit more, I have done um, the same kind of analysis really on a year base. Uh, and even for, for two kind of examples, but, but let's start with the one we know from, from those numbers uh, we talked about uh, a second ago. So hit rate was 55%, and so our target uh, per year has been 200 euros. So then I have done, let's call it that kind of experiment once, twice, third time, fourth time, and so on. So let's think about 14 traders doing one year exactly the same or using the same kind of statistics for the trading. And uh, so then we have first year 260 euro. Another one for one year would have earned 160. It's exactly that blue curve here. And you see the problem? We are doing trading, and what we know is that real statistics we can only have, have after hundreds, thousands of trades. And that's exactly what I want to show and want to share here with you, uh, that you cannot judge any trading strategy even after one year. Look, look for the fourth result here. That was a minus of minus 30 euro. And still that is within those kind of statistics. So even after one year with a profitable trading strategy, we would have lost 30 years. Okay, there are other examples with really good numbers. And indeed, with my average of 20% here, um, it's not that bad. In most cases, we are close to that. We don't lose uh, uh, money only in one year. But if I do the same kind of analysis just with a 10% target value, then it becomes much more difficult to, to, uh, to, to draw any conclusions, or at least from a, from a psychological side. Uh, we have a lot of years here where, and we, we lose money. And still, because that, that kind of statistics is done in the computer, so to say, um, so it's a proven profitable trading strategy and you see still there are a lot a couple of years and we lose money so it's really a hard job um, to judge whether we are on track with any trading strategy or not and it becomes even more problematic if you know that Yes, conditions might change markets might change and we might even um, think about is our strategy still valid, so to say? Uh, so all those aspects we have to keep in mind as well. And then still we have the kind of statistics. So we need lots of trades in order to have any statistical statement out of any trading strategy. Let's, let's go a little bit further in, uh, but exactly in the opposite side. Let's for a moment assume that we are able, I don't know how, but let's assume we are able to narrow down that target corridor to 5% to 10%. So within that level, not only between 5 and 10% as a really, uh, as a um, yearly profit, um, an annual profit between 5 and 10%. And for whatever reason, we can really be sure that we will between those two numbers, finally. Let's assume we can do that job. And honestly, that would be a brilliant job. Because if we really could do that, if we could narrow down that corridor to 5 to 
Okay, <laughs> then we can simply increase our risk per trade. Um, we started here in my example, or we used a similar strategy, what we had discussed a minute ago. Uh, we, we, we could increase our risk per trade from 10 euro to 20 euro. So we would not trade 0.02 lot, we would trade 0.04 lot. And then what does it mean? Hmm. We would have between 10% and 20% after one year. Brilliant. We can do even more. Why not go for a factor of 10? Uh, still, that would fit into our 1,000 euro account because if I do the quick calculation about our margin requirements, uh, which would be now be at 200 euro per trade, okay, that still would fit into our 1,000 euro account. So we finally end between 50% profit and 100% profit. Isn't that brilliant? Of course it is. But is that realistic? Unfortunately, not. The statement, the only statement I can do here is quite that nice sentence. So, and that is what is too nice to be true is indeed too nice to be true. And nothing else counts here. So whenever somebody is, is, is promising you, I can narrow down my, my uh, target corridor for uh, annual profit to those numbers and um, going here for, for CFD trading where we can still increase the risk per trade. Uh, so it's not like buying any stocks, um, uh, real stocks, not uh, CFDs. Um, if somebody is promising even those small numbers like 5 to 10 as being a corridor, I would be skeptical because you see how we can scale that up, we can leverage that up and still be within any margin requirements for a standard account. And I think you will not believe that you finally would have something between plus 50 and plus 100 and that every year. I repeat myself, of course one can or one might achieve numbers like that for a single year or there might be even people who is who are doing that within one month but i'm sure that cannot be repeated every month or every year within that kind of region of, of numbers keep that in mind um whenever you you listen to other people stories here Oh, we have already more or less done one hour here. So I come to my summary. So in a nutshell, the the view of the markets of a mathematician is really completely different from just looking to big profits and looking to charts around and uh, hopefully um, doing all the right interpretations. And you see, I use the frame as a phrase, uh, hope, uh, no, that's not the business of any mathematician. The job is proof statistical edges before you even open any trade. And only if you have a proof match, then you start a trade. What we have done is, as well here is that we look around about candlestick charts. And I still do that kind of statement that I say, those charts are brilliant, but for visualization only. They do, what they do is they compress our data in a, in a sense or in a, in a way that we can better look to those data so we don't have to look to those series of numbers. Um, our eye is much more capable to, to get the information visually and that's really a brilliant job of those charts, but nothing more. Even if you use indicators like an EMA, they don't have any intrinsic edge. We still can use them, for example, for noise reduction in order to see uh, what's really going around besides that wiggling around of the prices. But um, there's no intrinsic edge out of any EMA. And finally, oops, there's a spelling error once again here. <laughs> um, trading is really a business of small numbers. And it's really hard to tell whether we are on track or not from a statistical point. 
which I think I have illustrate, illustrated within uh, with my Excel sheet here. But of course, I think you will agree that trading is really a business of small numbers. It's not the one big trade which will turn uh, my account. No. What we target for is to have a sequence of trades which finally bring my equity to the north. And that's what we are aiming for. If you have any further questions, just um, even for some different aspects or topics, just send me an email. Or if you would like to have those kind of Excel sheets or the slides, uh, if you have not downloaded those, uh, no problem. Uh, then just send me an email to that uh, email address. Hopefully, I hope you enjoyed the webinar. And hopefully, I can see you again uh, next month. So it will take a little bit of time because I go on vacation next week uh, for three weeks. So, uh, but still, we will have uh, uh, another webinar around in, in February. And um, I'm still thinking about the topic. I have two in mind, uh, but uh, the, oh, the one would be Renko charts because those are another kind of visualization of. Uh, um, our tick data, quite well one. Rank or charts, or let's think about uh, portfolios, trading portfolios. I'm, let's see what I do. Okay, enjoy your time, enjoy the evening, and see you next time. Bye-bye.